did you know that Charles Dickens had an enduring obsession with mesmerism? It's quite interesting when you start digging into it because you can see how this belief informed his conception and presentation of ghosts and the supernatural within his stories. The themes that Dickens addresses most famously in his writing are the Victorian treatment of the poor and wider issues in society. But his ideas about the working of the mind come through in his work when you start to see his characters and their hauntings through the lens of this mesmeric philosophy. Even more curious still is Dickens' rejection of spiritualism, even though he had what his good friend and biographer John Forster called a hankering after ghosts. And it's not that Dickens exactly believed in ghosts, but he was intrigued by our belief in them. Within this paradox lies the possibility of ghosts, but also the continuation of this mesmeric idea that there is a slight possibility these ghosts are only in your mind. Despite his views on ghosts one way or the other, Dickens' popular journals helped establish the Christmas ghost story as a tradition. Although originally the 18th century French craze, mesmerism enjoyed a Victorian revival in the 1830s. University College Hospital founder and professor of practical medicine, Dr. John Elliotson, was a firm believer in mesmerism for medical treatment. And while Elliotson was a celebrated physician who, among other things, was the first in the UK to promote the use of the stethoscope. And that's a wonderful thing, but that was completely overshadowed by the fact that he had this scandal of mesmerism. And actually was fired from UCH and he was relegated to the fringe of the scientific community for practicing mesmerism on patients and performing them. One of Elliot's biggest offenders was Charles Dickens. And they both believed themselves to be mesmerists and they bonded over this. On the 24th of November in 1838, Charles Dickens would send a note to George Cruikshank inviting him to accompany him to John Elliotson's mesmeric experimentations. And the friendship between Elliotson and Dickens was created through their shared interest in these mesmeric phenomena. Elliotson began using the mesmeric trance to treat patients in 1837. And in 1838, he started conducting his experiments with mesmerism in the form of public displays. It was through Elliotson that Dickens first has his encounter with mesmerism. Elliotson relied on the spectacular powers demonstrated in particular by two patients in his hospital, two sisters, Elizabeth and Jane Oakey. Extraordinary scenes unfolded in the hospital, and they were witnessed by a large group of people. And it was actually reported on in the scientific journal, The Lancet. Alison Winter has explained this tussle that seemed to happen between scientists and what would happen in these demonstrations and the disagreements about what actually took place. So Elliotson was trying to demonstrate the physical laws that were governing mesmerism. And the sisters would take the opportunity to display mischievous irreverence to authority. And they laid claim to supernatural powers, clairvoyant powers. They could tell the future. They could read books with just the backs of their hands or their stomachs. And the most obvious symbolic challenge to the medical scientific authority came when Elizabeth O'Kay claimed that she actually had medical powers herself. And she said she could see the figure of death, which she called Big Jackie, hovering over patients. And apparently she said that Big Jackie was hovering over patient and um, patient was so terrified that they actually died. So it came true, but not in the way that people thought. So today, the idea of holding these medical experiments for an entertained public would be considered comically unprofessional. But this was also the era of surgical theaters and the surgeons would perform surgeries to a ticket holding public who would watch. The line between scientific inquiry and public event was quite blurred. However, these mesmeric displays were still one step too far for University College Hospital, even in that era. Elliotson's experiments on the O'Kee sisters finally came to a head at the home of a man named Thomas Wakeley. He was the editor of the Lancet Journal, and he'd now become a fierce opponent of mesmerism, and he tricked the O'Kee sisters into revealing their fakery. Elliotson was forced to resign his position from the hospital, and despite this dramatic fall from respectability, Dickens stuck by him. They were fast friends, and he supported him all through this bitter scandal. They remained friends for the rest of their lives. So far from retreating from public life, as one would do, and changing these alternative scientific beliefs, Elliotson seemed to double down, and he just went for it, and he founded his own journal called the Zoist in 1843. Now, in this journal, Elliotson further explored mesmeric phenomena, and this strange combination of phrenology with mesmerism. Now, phrenology is when you look at the bumps on a brain and it tells you about someone. So he put these two together and called it phrenomesmerism, which is 
very difficult to say. So he forged this link between mesmerism and phrenology to actually ironically put mesmerism more on a sound footing, the good sound footing of material science, the sound footing of phrenology. But it was this very association, of course, that led mesmerism down the road into just pop science theater. And it was only held in or less orthodox institutions like roadside shows and fairs and this kind of thing. Now, D Dickens learned his mesmeric technique from Elliotson, and he began experimenting on his own wife, like her, Catherine, and that began in Pittsburgh in March of 1842. Then he returned to England later that year, and he began experimenting on other members of his family and some friends. Fun was had by all. But it wasn't until 1845 that he started to study mesmeric forces in true earnest. This is after he completed Martin Chuzzlewick. Dickens was traveling to Genoa in Italy, when he took up the project of experimenting on a woman named Augusta de la Rue. She was the English-born wife of a Swiss banker. Madame de la Rue suffered from this generalized, unnameable cluster of, of issues that were happening with her. She had headaches, insomnia, tics, convulsions. There was a lot going on. Dickens felt that he had become adept enough, his mesmeric technique, to cure her. Dickens had firsthand experience in the mysterious powers of the mind that were displayed by Madame de la Rue, and he thought mesmeric treatment he could apply it, and he made a deep impression on him that it was working. And this also colored his attitude towards ghosts, this idea of the mind link. So now Dickens' clinical deployment of the science of mesmerism substantiated his therapeutic possibilities. He felt he had proof this was working. His final and unfinished novel, The Mystery of Edward Drood, explores the idea of a malevolent mesmerist, John Casper, and he penetrates Rosabud's mind to impose his sexual desire. So this is the idea of mesmerism not to cure, but to harm. This incomplete novel is an exposition of altered states, trying to understand, looking at different modes of consciousness, and also exploring mesmerism's potential. But he leaves that bit unclosed, because obviously the, the novel's unfinished. But he was anticipating science's ambiguous position, and he was almost not wanting to speak one way or the other. He was leaving it up to the interpretation of the reader. Now, while this dedication to mesmerism might lead one to think that Dickens had an open mind to all things that were esoteric, that would not be an accurate assessment. Dickens' interest in mesmerism was largely therapeutic, and it was not from a spiritual perspective at all. And John Eliotson's phrenological interest in the material configurations of the body and mind, they had that in common. So the idea behind mesmerism that struck Dickens was it's this supposed link with material science, and these ideas belonging to spiritualism, however, he did not take seriously. And it's interesting to think that when you remember, this was arguably the father of the Victorian ghost story, most famously um, of A Christmas Carol. And um, as Chesterton calls that story, it's that enjoyable nightmare. And even then in The Christmas Carol, if you remember when he first sees Marley, he goes, oh, you're just an un undigested bit of beef, underdone turnip, and this idea that there's a physical cause for ghosts, not necessarily a spiritual one. But I still think the ghosts are real in that story. But there's an interesting link here um, between what Dickens saw, the scientific basis of mesmerism, and the scientific aspects of spiritualism, because notably it's this idea of magical technologies. So this is one of the aspects of spiritualism that did interest Dickens. And although to him these technologies were not to reach beyond the veil or anything like that, they were just to dig deeper into the possibilities within your own fellow man. So the Victorian era was a time when all technologies seemed quite magical. The telegraph was invented in 1838, electric light was invented, and it's not miles away to make the cognitive leap that if these invisible forces could bring us communication with each other across miles, across space and linking objects, and these idea that flowing invisible forces create light, what else might be able to travel along those, those invisible pathways, linking people and objects separated by distance, perhaps even separated by death? Perhaps Dickens wasn't ready to make that leap, but many men of science were converts to spiritualism, most famously the evolutionary theorist Alfred Russell Wallace, partly because spiritualism figured within these new technologies like the telegraph or the telephone. It wasn't so easy to look at what we would call hard science versus marginal science in the Victorian era. All of it was so new. And we can, of course, look with our 21st century retrospective eye and go, oh, well, you know, this was hard science, this was esoteric. At the time, it was just this soup of exciting stuff. The genius in what Dickens created with his annual Christmas ghost stories was what Chesterton calls the kinship between gaiety and the grotesque. And this is something that you don't even have to believe in ghosts to understand, is this amazing feeling of cozy. So within the strange combination of what he has been called the prophet of the hearth, 
These cozy family tales are told around roaring fire and they contain spine tingling delights. He tapped into what we now is a commonly acknowledged source of cozy. It's this idea of the amplification of your own sense of warmth and safety juxtaposed against cold, dangerous, horrible things happening outside. Within the classic, iconic, middle-class Victorian Christmas ideal was this little unheimlich gift, this little prick that was in the Christmas bag. And that is what heightened the joy of all the rest. That is just a little snippet of the combination between mesmerism, spiritualism, Dickens, and ghosts. I also have an audio walk through Bloomsbury that is about spiritualism that you can listen to anywhere in the world if you want to hear more. It starts at the Charles Dickens Museum and then takes you on a walk through Bloomsbury. That's everything I'm going to cover today in this little short talk. 